Hello, today we're going to be talking about structure 1.3.1, um, which has to do with the emission spectra. Um, they're produced by atoms emitting photons when electrons in excited states return to lower energy levels. Um, and this is part of uh, structure 1.3. Okay, so let's review a few things about waves uh, because light and all kinds of electromagnetic radiation will travel as a wave. So there's your generic wave structure. The distance from the midline to the crest is known as the amplitude. Um, although that's not super important for chemistry. The distance between two crests is known as the wavelength. And we typically use the Greek letter lambda to represent wavelength. Now, if you were to count the number of waves that pass a point in a particular amount of time, that would be called the frequency. Um, Typically, they'll be like per second, how many waves pass per second frequency. And sometimes I've seen F for frequency, and sometimes I've seen the Greek letter nu, which looks like a V for frequency. Um, so that's waves. Now, light will also travel as photons, which are discrete packets of that light energy. Um, so you can think of it as light particles. And one of the interesting things about electromagnetic radiation is that it has this like wave particle duality. So sometimes you can think of it as a um, particle, individual photons or particles that are traveling and, and behaving in certain ways. But you can also um, think about them as waves with wavelength, frequency, energy, etc. Um, so just kind of have this idea that uh, it's kind of doing both. Um, we don't need to get too in-depth with that in uh, this course, but um, we will talk about photons as those light particles, and we will talk about uh, the wave structure, wave-like behavior. So let's talk about the relationships then between energy, frequency, and wavelength. I'm going to use E for energy, F for frequency, and lambda for wavelength. Um, energy... Well, let's let's go ahead and draw a wave first. We'll draw a wave like this, and we'll draw a wave like this. That'll be easier. Um, so if you'll notice, this top wave has a longer distance between the two crests than the bottom wave. I'll call this one A and B. So A has a longer wavelength. Uh, B has a shorter wavelength. Now, if we're talking about frequency is the amount of uh, waves that pass a point in a given amount of time. So let's say that our measurement time is from the, the beginning to this time t. You can see there's like two waves that pass for a and uh, maybe three to four. Um, this is not to scale three to four waves for b. So you can notice that there is a greater frequency for b and a lower frequency for a. So you can see that relationship there is um, opposite, essentially. As you have a longer wavelength, you'll have uh, lower frequencies. If you have a shorter wavelength, you will have greater frequencies. And energy is directly um, related to frequency. So the lower the frequency, the lower the energy of that light. Um, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy of that light. Um, think about it as we need to do more waves in a given amount of time, so that's going to require more energy. And so those are the relationships that you should know. Okay, so here is a really nice graphic that relates the different um, types of electromagnetic radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum, or EMS, um, and to their waves. So you can see radio waves have the longest wavelength, and then uh, microwaves and then infrared visible then ultraviolet, then x-rays, then gamma rays. And so again, we're going from the lowest wavelength, I'm sorry, from the longest wavelength to the shortest wavelength. So because of that, um, and because of the relationship that we talked about earlier, the radio waves will have the lowest frequency. Gamma rays will have the highest frequency, um, which you can see in that wave drawing. And of course, frequency and energy are directly related. So radio waves have the lowest energy, gamma rays have the highest energy. Now this makes sense um, if you're familiar with any of these types. Um, radio and microwaves have the lowest energy. We use those all the time regularly. 
Um, radio waves also will travel with longer distance because of that long wavelength, um, which is why they can be broadcast um, through the radio, essentially. Um, you'll also see uh, visible light right in the middle there, and um, you can see the colors of light go from red having the longest wavelengths and the lowest frequencies, uh, lowest energy, and then um, all the way following rainbow order up through blue and violet, um, having the highest energy and the shortest wavelengths. Um, and I always remember that because I, you see infrared is literally means below red. Um, so that's the closest to red in the visible light. And then past visible is ultraviolet. So that's greater than violet. Um, so you, you can always figure out the uh, rainbow order of visible light that way. Um, and then, of course, X-rays and gamma rays have higher energies um, and shorter wavelengths. Um, they have more penetrating power. Um, think X-rays are used to um, image, like, your bones, essentially, uh, or your teeth. And so it's be able to pass through um, the fleshy bits and get into um, your body. And it's, you know, it can be harmful to get too many X-rays. Um, and gamma rays we'll typically think about with uh, nuclear radiation. Um, so the most penetrating. Um, so I have an idea of these different types of electromagnetic radiation and how that relates to wavelength, frequency, and energy. Okay, so here is a more specific breakdown of those different colors of visible light. Um, and this one's flipped from the previous image. So you'll see the shortest wavelengths are the violets and purples and the longest wavelengths are those uh, reds. And so, of course, um, if this is shorter wavelength, it's going to have a higher frequency, and uh, longer wavelength will be a lower frequency. Um, visible light is roughly in this 400 to 700-ish range. You don't need to know the like exact wavelengths for those colors, but if you know visible is roughly 400 700 that's very useful in nanometers and then of course you should have an idea that um, shorter wavelengths than uh, violet will be ultraviolet and longer wavelengths than red will be infrared those things are super useful um, it also might be worth your time to make sure you know that that uh, nanometers the relationship between nanometers and meters um, so that prefix nano means um, times 10 to the negative ninth. So one nanometer, let me write it, is equal to one times 10 to the negative ninth meters. Okay, so if you have a white light source, um, white visible light, you can see it, and you pass that white light through a prism, it's going to split up the white light into the different colors. And so you'll see that a split of the different colors is what we call a continuous spectra. Um, because you can see all of the um, colors within there making this like one image, basically. So it's continuous. We use uh, prisms in different ways in chemistry, but the one that leaps to my mind is in spectrophotometers. So you'll have a light source inside your spectrophotometer, and then it passes through some kind of prism that will separate the light into different colors. And then um, depending on the setting on your spectrophotometer, you can then pass that continuous spectra through what's called a diffraction grating and separate just the one color that you're looking for, the one color that you need for your experiment. Um, so you're starting with a continuous spectrum and then you're isolating just one uh, individual color. So in contrast to a continuous spectrum, you have these things called line spectra. These result from atomic emission. So when atoms absorb energy, uh, their electrons get excited. And then when the electrons move back to lower energy levels, they release the excess energy in specific colors. And so you can see those specific colors of light in the line spectra. And we're going to get a lot more in depth with these in a later section. Um, but I wanted to show you this as a contrast to continuous spectra. Um, you should also kind of have an idea that we'll use um, spectral tubes, what we call spectral tubes, 
where basically you're going to trap a bunch of that gas in a tube and you'll pass electricity through it. And when the electricity passes through, that's providing the energy needed to move the electrons between energy levels. And so it will emit a color. And effectively, it's going to be, if we're doing hydrogen, it's going to be a mixture of the four bands that you're seeing in the hydrogen line spectrum. And from there, you can take a prism and pass the light through and it will separate into those four individual colors. Um, and so that's a very common um, experiment that you'll see are these gas spectrum tubes. Um, and then you'll separate the light using a prism. Now the last type of uh, spectrum that I want to talk about is called an absorption spectrum. And this is how we figured out the, and I say we, but how scientists figured out how the different elements that are present in stars. Um, so what happens is you, you basically collect the light, and I don't mean physically collect, but like you're getting a reading from the light, um, and you are passing it through some medium, okay, and in this case it's the sodium rich atmosphere of a planet, and then from there you're going to put that light through the prism, which will separate the different colors, and you'll notice that there's two dark spots. Okay, those dark spots are the wavelengths of light that are absorbed by that sodium rich atmosphere. So that's why you're not seeing them in the actual ab absorption line spectrum because it was already absorbed by the other element. Um, so this is helping us to figure out what different elements were present in stars, which is kind of neat. It's kind of the reverse of uh, an atomic emission spectrum where you are only seeing the light where the um, electrons are transferring between energy levels. This one, you're um, measuring all of the light that didn't get absorbed. Now, another lab that we do fairly frequently uh, is something called a flame test. And um, effectively, you're going to take the salt that you're testing and get a little bit on your um, metal loop, or sometimes we'll use Q-tips, and put it into a Bunsen burner flame, and it will glow different colors depending on the element. Um, notice how you're, they're usually chlorine salts because the chlorine itself isn't going to um, emit a color in the visible range but the other element, the metal, is going to emit a color in the visible range, at least these metals. And you don't need to know the specific colors, but um, the fact that they are producing different colors can help us uh, identify what is present in a particular, um, like maybe in an unknown. So we can use this for like analytical chemistry where we're identifying unknown substances. Um, by putting it in a flame and seeing what color is being emitted. Okay, so let's look at one example. Um, which color of visible light has the highest energy and which color of visible light has the longest wavelength? Um, so if we think about this, I'm going to do the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, red is going to have the longest wavelength. So that's for our second question here and violet will have the shortest wavelength. Because of that, red has the lowest frequency and violet has the highest frequency in visible light. And then um, it follows that red light will have the lowest energy and violet light will have the highest energy of the visible light. So violet is the answer for that first question.